for all this stuff, whether it's Twittery, whether it's um, community bloggers, we now have created, and look for this to be a, a template we have in the Metro section now, which is mostly online, um, this thing called The Local. They're, they're basically it's citizen journalism funneled through one or two reporters in the, in the boroughs of New York and, and in New Jersey. As a, and that's what you're going to see more of, a, a synthetic uh, um, a aggregation, but not just aggregation, a, a, a paper that, paper, <laughs> a, a, an entity, a medium that is a go-to place for some sense of an authoritative sifting of all this, this cloud of information we're all surrounded by. But that, that requires citizen involvement, the citizen involvement. Well, I, I, I want to sort of take it back to the, the project here and at Stanford and others. So let's, we have the best and the brightest here, and they've gone through our top educational programs. And, uh, um, and at BARD, we're not training scientists. We're training uh, policy analysts, if you will, or policy advocates. Uh, and a question that Norton raised earlier that was sort of implicit in my conversation, which was, because I started this with a little discussion of the Republic. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so assuming that, that, you know, at a place like Bard, we're, we're, we're training people with, with, the, with the best information uh, to, to, to do good analysis, but then we want them to take it another level. Now, for Pam, her, her mission is to, is to get scientists to be better sources of information for policymakers. But Victor mentioned, that you know, it's actually the people who are making the decisions. That's who we really want our Bard graduates to be. Uh, so the question that I have is, how can we inspire young people to take on that troublesome role? I mean, that, that to really dedicate themselves to the kinds of changes <clears throat> that the world is going to need to see over the next few decades. To, and let's say not to avoid an impoverished future, but to take up the opportunities that are there to really enrich the future. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, if I understand the question correctly, which I'm not sure I do, I think that the um, first thing is that the citizen, and that follows what Andy said, has to feel that she or he actually has some ownership of the decision. And for that, they have to be, be able to understand it. So. In order to convince a generation or individuals or leadership to go in a certain direction, they have to feel that they, this wasn't imposed on them, but actually they, they had a hand in, in making that decision. Um, the, the, the second thing is something you said, which I think is absolutely right, that the scientist, the, first of all, the people who do the communication have to be respected by the people who are doing the work. There's always a status issue, you know, where People who are expert are not generous because their self-worth depends on the dependency of the non-expert. The doctor really doesn't want you to know a lot about medicine because no. you're going to second guess the doctor and the doctor likes to be the boss. And we're all people are like that, just human nature, you know. And so if you're a well-informed patient, you're a pain in the neck. You know, um, uh, yeah. because you're second guessing. You know, only anesthesia puts you out of the <laughs> out of the running. You know, so so the question is, but you're a citizen worried about climate. You know, and you're you're a participant. So the question is that the that the translator, or the communicator, someone in your position, has to be respected by the people doing the work. They have to respect, and we have to have people elected to public office who can discriminate between two experts who disagree. If science is about anything, it's about non-consensual science. In other words, there are people, there's a whole crowd of people who believe X, and then there are people who are naysayers. And all for the naysayers to end up being right. Even we don't like them, we don't want, and that's why you don't put the, the naysayers down. You don't knock them out. And that's why there are rules of evidence, there are rules of the game. And, you know, do you have a replicable experiment? Is cold fusion really a joke, or does it really work? And if I can't repeat it, then it doesn't work, and then you can talk all you want. And then you have to put this, you have to join forces in putting to bed sort of the religious apocalyptic group that really somewhere don't want it to change. You know, they, they're just happy because it's part of a prophetic, you know, end of time. Being not Christian, I have no sympathy for this argument at all. <laughs> and so I'm not interested in some kind of vision of, you know, I know I'm from dust to dust, so I'd rather make it palatable on Earth. So I'm interested in human history. So the question is, do we have leadership that's able 
to tolerate and discriminate, as in, as in even foreign policy. You know, we get experts who will know something about a world that the President of the United States doesn't know about. That's what we hope a good president will do, or a good senator will do, or a good mayor will do, or is to listen and then be able to communicate a recommendation or legislature that the public can understand the reasons why they chose this path as opposed to that path, and where there are rules of evidence, probabilities, risks assessed, you know, in a candid way that the public can debate. And by the way, one other thing that, that we have to get comfortable with, um, to have the innovation happen that will need to happen on the technological front, uh, we have to get comfortable with failure. Uh, this, we had this whole, when I grew up, I remember uh, there was uh, Senator Proxmire used to hand out this uh, Golden Fleece Award to all these ridiculous government programs that um, were wasting money. You know, some of the, you know, $500 toilet seat, absolutely. But sometimes those things, th the aspersions were cast on basic research, fundamental kind of blue sky stuff. And if we're not, you're not going to have the inquiry and the, the adventure and the, and the misadventure that would be, to, to double our energy menu between now and 2050 to serve 9 billion people roughly with even marginal energy needs, setting aside the climate problem is a huge task. And, yep. and, and innovation in, in at the policy level, being somehow able to communicate to a community that failure is normal. And if you, don't, if you want to have innovation, you have to have 199 failures for one transformative thing that becomes fiber optics. And I think what, what, what Annie says is absolutely true in the current policy debate. I'm worried about the stimulus package as far as it's influenced universities because if you give money to solve the environmental issues or to solve cancer, the research that's being done there is not always directly utilitarian. It's precisely some absolute blue sky basic research that will catapult us from a sequential improvement in what we can do to a fundamental improvement in what we can do. So the failure of the public and politicians to, so in other words, in order to get the, the, the cancer cure research money or the foodstuffs improvement research money, I have to make an elaborate argument which is not plausible about how my study of cell function will actually lead to this. Well, it's the basic, the tolerance for basic research and for failures. Um, and the honorable failures uh, have had huge positive impact. In, in social engineering, for example, let's take something like Esperanto. <laughs> Esperanto is a failure. But it was a great idea that spread the idea of universal communication of a shared language, right? Yeah. And actually, we've sort of crept into one, which is English. But yeah. the tolerance for that, the idea that there was a need to supplant national differences by a common language, was a good idea, even though it was a failure. That's interesting. I want to jump in on this, you know, the, the discussion of science and the scientific method, because, you know, as an economist or a social scientist, the way I in, work in the environmental field, I always I look for the consensus science, and then I make some assessment of the risks, and then I have to make policy recommendations. So, on the one hand, we want to train our students to be skeptical and listen to both sides. But I think, uh, is there a balance there between also then training them, at the end of the day, you've got to make a decision. Uh, and if you're going to be a leader, you have to make a decision that's going to empower others to sort of follow in the, so what, it, I, I'm a little concerned about the academy sort of creating people who are too much on the one hand, on the other hand. And this gets back to the sort of, how do you engage philosophers into sort of getting into the messy real world? 